Cheers, guys. Mm. Epix 911, welcome to the Elitist Geek VR News for Monday, July 25th. So before we get to, you know what? Not before we get to the news. Let's do the news first, then we'll get to the personal bit. Uh, I'll actually tie it into uh, into this uh, pretty cool little announcement, which I'm excited about, and hopefully some of you as well. First news piece I wanted to talk about concerns uh, statements made by Jason Kingsley, who is the CEO of British video game developer Rebellion. And he had a concern, and his quote was essentially, VR could make horror games way too intense. Now, his company specializes on, you know, shock value in a lot of their games. As always, I will have the link below so you can check them out. But just to give you an example, in one of their games, you play the part of a sniper and you are able to do a bullet kill cam style viewing. And it's not enough to just show you the bullet tearing through your hapless enemy, but the gory aftermath is there for you as well. And he brings up a really good point because one of the games that I'd recorded to show, which is in my long lost editing pile, was to do with hordes or horde Z or horde Z, however the hell you want to call it. It has Doom 3 era graphics, okay? Which don't look that impressive anymore, right? 3D on a 2D monitor, load up Doom 3. It holds its age okay, but I wouldn't consider it special by any means, right? In VR, they are freaking terrifying. Like, I'm seriously mean terrifying. It was the first VR game that I played that wasn't, you know, tech demo-y or mini gamey. So I'd done the job simulator, I'd done the lab, I played the zombie training simulator, Spice Pirate, uh, Space Pirate, Spice Pirate. Anyways, this was the first game that went for more realistic graphics that I happened to try, and it freaked the shit out of me. Like, I was freaked out. It was so intense with the zombies coming in on me that, yeah, I pansied out, took the HMD off because I was overwhelmed. And it's that old fight or fight, fight or flight reflex that we humans have. What most experts always fail to mention is there's a third variable. Yes, humans and animals have an instinct called fight or flight. But those aren't the only two behaviors that happen. There's a third behavior, and that is one of stunned. If an animal doesn't fight, doesn't flight, it's usually because it's stunned. And that just means the animal seizes up and is unable to do anything. That's what happened to me. I was stunned. <laughs> and it took a few seconds to process. Obviously, I know it's a game. Obviously, I know it can't hurt me, but the brain game to brain connection was such in that VR environment that for that split second, it stunned me enough to get overwhelmed and indecisive to the point where now instead of two zombies, three more join in on the fray and you realize your situation is hopeless much as you would in real life if five zombies were chomping down on you, right? That was the predicament I found myself in. That was how I reacted. So he has a point fundamentally, and he takes it one step further with his own employees. He will actually mandate a 30 minute respite after VR experiences. They are not allowed to drive straight home. And he had one employee that basically had an adverse reaction. And look, there's always exceptions. Just like I am so glad I'm not one of those people, like some of you, who gets nausea. I've played the crappiest VR frame rate games, trust me, and don't even get a split second of nausea. Whether it's fluid, not fluid, I get annoyed, but I don't get sick. So I can totally see how some ha would have issue being able to separate fact from fantasy, right? 
And yeah, so he basically had that because he had one guy who had trouble adjusting one employee. So he started that as a company policy, obviously health and safety driven policy, right? But uh, what are your thoughts on that, on VR or horror in VR? Because the main point he brings up, so true, is that, look, every other medium, whether it's been movies, television, books, you're an observer. You are, you know, a bystander who can't involve himself in the scene. In virtual reality, it's way more personal. You are there. So horror would take on a whole new meaning. And I, I know just from how I felt in hordes, right? If it had been even more intense, it definitely would have had a more visceral impact on me than it did. And like I said, I was already stunned. So the problem that I have is I'm not a type A personality, right? I don't, you know, I'm not an adrenaline junkie in the sense of doing stuff that I know could have a real life consequence. I'm more of a play it safe type A adrenaline junkie. I'll do the roller coasters, you know, the things that I know are safe because I'm freaked of heights. Rock climbing, yeah, no, not my thing. Talking to you on a balcony on the 30th floor, also not my thing. I talked about that in a previous video. So in virtual reality, yeah, I could see, <laughs> given the right medium, you know, the way they choose to deliver that horror in the game, that uh, I would love it. I'd be super freaked out, but at the same time kind of drawn to it, which, what can I say? That's what happens when you've been gaming as long as I have. So, interested in knowing your thoughts on that, guys. Uh, well, yeah, where do you stand on that? Now, the next article is going to tie into the personal one a little bit. And this has to do with uh, XMG. Now, they are a German tech manufacturer. They're known for their high-end XMG laptops. And these things are beasts, like absolute beasts. So they did a demo where they showed off their latest card-specific XMG models for backpack play. And I'm sure most of you have seen this by now, the backpack, which the idea there is to try to make it as light and, you know, not too cumbersome of an experience so that you retain the immersion, right? Obviously, if it's a VR game about, uh, you know, hiking on an Antarctic expedition with a backpack, it's even probably going to be more immersive. But for other games, having too much weight and bulk could be a hindrance, right? So anyways, they did the demo. They tailor specifically to 1060s, 1070s, or 1080s video cards. And that is where my wheels started spinning. So I'll have the link for that. If you want to find out more, you can, you can check that out. But I had announced probably a couple of weeks ago now that uh, one of my videos is going to be a build your own virtual reality PC, right? Take those of you who aren't familiar with the process through the process from start to finish. I'll spec the parts, cut it down with some actual editing because I tend to take stuff in one cut, but I will edit it for this so you're not left snoozing as I'm driving to the parts store. But we'll spec them out together, we will select the parts, and then we will build it, but there's going to be a twist. Because I remembered suddenly when I watched or read that article about XMG, the mini ITX friendly 1070, that gigabyte released. I don't know if any of you remember this, it was about a month ago. I didn't talk about it here on the program, but it definitely stuck in my mind. I will, uh, it's Tech Radar who basically had the story or have the story 30 days ago. It's still on there. I'll have the link below. But that got me thinking, why not take that one notch up and instead of building my own VR-friendly PC, why not my own VR-friendly backpack PC? Because I talked to Mean Talk in my video about branding, right? And how you build your own PC, you could put your own brand stamp on it. Well, what better way to do that than get us a mini ITX case, right? Small as I can get, that'll handle that very small ITX-friendly 1070, which, by the way, has all the power of a full 1070. 
It's even an overclocked model. So that's freaking fantastic. And then see what we can do with it. I thought that would be super cool. I can't wait to do it because it will also free me from the tether of the Vive and the Rift. So using a 1070, I think it's just gonna be perfect uh, with Windows 10 and you know 16 gigs of memory. Nice gaming friendly ITX motherboard to do exactly that. And I'll probably go with water cooling for everything just so that there's no noise and you know massive moving parts. But anyways, that'll be the build that I film. So I think that's cool. I can't wait to start. I'm actually jonesing about that because the cord, while functional, is freaking annoying from time to time, as you guys well know, right? The next thing I wanted to talk about uh, concerns NVIDIA again. And it's a claim that they made on Road to VR about their VRWorks 360 product. And a claim that it's going to be able to do real-time VR video stitching, editing. There are really no tools out there right now. And if some of you know of some, let me know in the descriptions, comments below, right? I'm not aware of any, but I on honestly haven't even looked to see what's available. But um, yeah, I think that would just be, if they can pull off what they're claiming, and I'm gonna dig into it a little bit more, that would be really cool because you'd be able to in real time do 360 film editing and why I'm so excited about that is it should allow every Tom, Dick and Harry or Sally or Sue who has a 360 camera to create content in a much less painstaking way, right? Will this mean a glut of cruft videos? Probably, but almost guaranteed there's going to be gems in there and it's going to expand the availability that we have as VR consumers for experiencing 360 content. So I find that hella cool, can't wait. Definitely I'm gonna read up more as that uh, draws closer. Now, about a week ago, I talked about the open source HMD, right? The OSVR. Well, there's another headset manufacturer that is creating an HMD called the VESO, V-E-E, so and what this does is it tracks facial movements so facial musculature in your face expressions for the sole purpose of enhancing interaction not only you know you with the character you're playing in a game in vr but with the artificial intelligence the npcs if you will around you and again how freaking awesome is VR that it can go off in all of these directions, right? Now, as a project manager, the issue I have with that right away is my instinct to prevent scope creep, right? Anybody who manages projects, you know that scope creep is usually the death of a project because people want to keep adding stuff and you never get across the finish line. Yes, absolutely, that's a concern, obviously. But we're at that early stage where in my opinion, all that innovation is good. Some of it's gonna stick, a lot of it won't. But this is one area that I really hope sticks because I get instantly, my favorite genre is RPGs, right? CRPGs, JRPGs, you name it. What better way to role play than to actually be able to use facial gestures, right? At least as an option, just like with locomotion, I don't think it should be the sole way to go about it in a game but an option so either you you know you pick or take the dialogue route right where you're selecting choice a b c or you can try to bluff the game right and imagine what that does to bartering in an rpg right you're haggling with a store keep he's able to read facial expressions are you bluffing are you angry? Are you scared or intimidated? All of that stuff has such awesome, awesome potential for really differentiating VR from any type of gaming, right? Seeing that stuff unfold just totally makes me just nerd out, right? Love it, love it. 
want to see more of it. Um, also got that in the link below, so check that out. The last, but ties into VR uh, environments again, is an article from Road to VR. There is a Swedish company, uh, Be Real, they're called. They're from Stockholm or headquartered in Stockholm. And they are working on object interaction in a VR world, which right now, Solus Project is a perfect example of what I'm about to say. Um, and it was actually a thought of mine as recently as just a couple of days ago was the physics of objects in VR. Right now, they all have the same weight, right? You pick up a gigantic boulder in the Solace Project and as much effort is exerted as picking up a feather or a piece of paper. There's no difference. What their study found is that it created a stronger sense of immersion with one caveat, right? Assigning weights and mass and momentum to objects if it was integral to the action being performed, right? In other words, an important thing is happening in the game. Wow. Like, again, just with the facial expressions, but now we're off in the direction of physical environment. So imagine that, right? Imagine having an invisible tether to the objects in the game. If you try to move that big boulder too fast, you're going to drop it if your character doesn't have the strength, right? Versus a feather. Think of it in terms of like a tower defense game building up your defenses. Do you take the quick route, put up as many light planks of wood in a VR tower defense game, or do you put two or three of those concrete blocks in place? Harder to move, more time consuming, but ultimately better defensively. My mind just went off in four billion directions. Uh, again, nerded out completely on that one. Gotta have a sip of beer, too freaking awesome. There we go. But yeah, being able to differentiate, you know, between objects, there's overkill. And like I said, they, the caveat for them was it had to be integral to the action being performed. So it couldn't just be willy nilly, everything in the world reacting like that, right? People got way more immersed into it. If that was the case, if it was, if it was an important function being carried out. And so tower defense was one thing, crafting a whole other thing, right? Again, craft something quick versus craft something more, you know, long lived, but takes you longer to build, whether it's RPGs, sports games, cockpit style games. There's just so much potential for that. Anyways, guys, that's it for me. Hope you enjoyed and can't wait to read some of your comments. As always, guys, cheers.